All right, so we're going to start um, looking at uh, organometallic reagents, uh, particularly in this uh, lecture, just the synthesis of them and their considerations. Now, organometallic reagents are probably the, the one that you are most familiar with at this point, and you've seen it first year, are your Grignard reagents that look something like this. Uh, but we're also in this course going to be looking at organolithium reagents, which uh, are very similar to Grignard reagents. Instead of magnesium, we have a lithium uh, iron over there. Both of them are high energy sigma bonds which are incredibly nucleophilic and are great at adding to uh, electrophiles. Um, the one consideration that we have to consider with all of these things is that these reagents are not compatible at all with acidic protons. Uh, and remember now we go back to our acids and bases. Uh, if we had to change this metal back to a hydrogen, the pKa of a hydrogen on, an, in this case, an aromatic system is about 40. Um, and that means that this is an incredibly strong base. Both of these are incredibly strong bases, uh, which will very quickly deprotonate uh, any acidic protons. And hence, one of the, re uh, that's even water, is, is uh, easy enough to, to deprotonate. And you are well aware that, for instance, when we do these reactions or we use these reactions, we have to exclude water. So this really is something that you have to watch uh, carefully. We cannot have any acidic protons uh, in uh, with these reagents. That said, we're going to just quickly look at the ways that we can synthesize these types of compounds. <clears throat> and uh, for all intents and purposes, there are really two uh, only two methods that we need to worry about. The first is one which you've already looked at and have learned in first year, and that is oxidative addition. So oxidative addition is just this. It is where we take the pure metal in its unoxidized form and we add it to, in this case over here, we add it to bromobenzene. So we would just take something like this, and all we do is we add magnesium to it which is magnesium in the zero oxidation state, and it inserts over there and becomes magnesium 2, uh, and we get our uh, Grignard reagent. Uh, so that is one of the easiest ways of making Grignard reagents and uh, possibly the, the most common uh, that, uh, that will occur. We can do exactly the same thing with organolithiums. Uh, I'm just going to choose a slightly different one, uh, such as this one, this is butyl chloride, if we treat it with just plain lithium, what happens is we get the oxidative insertion and we end up with the <clears throat> lithium over there. Um, what happened to the chlorine? Well, actually, to balance this reaction, we need two lithiums, uh, and we're going to end up with uh, a lithium uh, chloride as well. So it's two lithiums will be needed to, to do that. So we get a salt that gets formed uh, at the end. So both of these are examples of oxidative addition and are very common ways of making uh, organolithium reagents um, and Grignard reagents. Uh, so this over here is an important uh, um, organolithium and at this point I just want to do a slight divergence because um, this is a very common base, a very powerful base because if we change that hydrogen on a carbon the pKa is about 50 aromatic one it's about 40 but on a normal carbon it's about 50 and so this is an incredibly strong base and we actually have three versions of this butyl lithium which are readily available and easy to uh, to buy so we should just quickly have a look at that so we have uh, n buley which is n butyl lithium this is the normal one and that looks like exactly what i drew out over there it's just four carbons like that then we have s buley which is sec butyl lithium and that looks like this um, so it's just uh, at the secondary position and it's a little bit more stronger base than this one over there. The, the details of that are not important at this stage uh, and then lastly we have t butyl lithium which is an incredibly strong uh, base it's the strongest of the three of them uh, very sterically bulky as well, and it looks uh, something like that. So right now you should be able to, just by looking at this reaction, you should be able to figure out how we would make uh, these ones uh, under the same types of conditions. So the second method that we're going to be looking at is a really important one, and it's metal halogen exchange. 
This is most common with uh, organolithium reagents. I'm going to give you an example of that first. And very simply, uh, going back to just our uh, trying to make our uh, phenyl uh, uh, organometallic, so we could have added magnesium to this. We could add just pure lithium to it to get the lithium uh, on this side over there. In other words, to go to this. Uh, but from a practical point of view, uh, to add pure lithium here in order to go to this over, over there is actually something that just generally doesn't happen because it's quite a slow process and not as uh, efficient. Um, so we do want this reagent and a better way to do it with a little bit more uh, control is to use one of the alkyl lithiums that I've already spoken to you, which is readily available, such as butyl lithium over there, and we do a metal halogen exchange. So what's happened here is that the bromine and the lithium have exchanged with each other. In fact, uh, the other side product that gets formed is this over there. Uh, and, and this will actually end up decomposing. It could be a problem in the reaction, but it just ends up uh, decomposing. <clears throat> There's some pathways which we haven't covered yet in this course, uh, elimination methods. So that gets away. But essentially, we have switched the two around. There is actually debate in terms of this mechanism. So I'm not showing you a mechanism about how this is happening. Uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, sort of ideas is there's a type of a metathesis, which means that there's a swapping of partners. So this carbon goes to the bromine, this lithium goes to this carbon, and they kind of there's a four tron member transition state, and they switch around. Uh, but other people have been looking at some other aspects of involving radical chemistry. That's not important. For what the most important thing here is that if we have a halogen and we've got um, an alkyl lithium like that, we can switch the two around. This also would happen, by the way, if the lithium was a magnesium bromide. Okay, exactly the same thing would happen. The question you've got to be asking yourselves is why does this happen? Um, why, if these two can switch around, why don't those two switch around and go back and go back to an equilibrium? The answer to that is actually they can switch around. Um, but if we go back to our pKa's, this carbon over here has a pKa when it's protonated of 50. This carbon over here, when it is protonated, has a pKa of 40. It means that this carbon as a minus is actually far less stable than this one over there. And so this organolithium, the phenyl organolithium over there, is a lot more stable than the n butyl lithium reagent. All right, so it's connected to the pKa's. Um, and so this is a very, very common way of generating organolithiums, particularly on aryl rings, when we have some sort of uh, halogen over there. Okay. Metal halogen exchange, though, going back to considerations, is actually one of the, uh, actually gives us one of the, the problems that uh, we face. And that relates to something as simple as this. So let me just for example, I'm going to take a really random example, but I'm going to say I want to take this uh, reagent over there, and I know that the Grignard reagents, for instance, are, are fantastic uh, nucleophiles. So I want to take this Grignard reagent over there, and I want it to go to add as a nucleophile to this carbon over there and kick out the leaving group like that. That's what I want to ha happen. In other words, I want us to give us this product over there. So we've got the four carbons, one, two, three, four, and we've made a new bond to that carbon over there, which is then connected to the phenyl ring. Okay. So that's what, this is the, the new bond that would have been formed over there. That's what we want to happen. But metal halogen exchange is the thing that messes everything up. Uh, because what happens is, while you will get this reaction happening, you're also going to get these two swapping partners. So what's going to happen is you're going to get some of this being formed, MgBr. Okay, so those are swapped around, and this has swapped around as well. And we're going to get a bromine over there. All right, now some of you are saying... Okay, profan, it's, uh, that's not too much of a difference because now if this adds to there, I'm still going to get the same product. So what's the problem? 
the problem is actually what's happening in the reaction. Remember, the reaction does not consist of two molecules um, reacting. The reaction consists of billions and billions and billions of molecules. And in the reaction, because of metal halogen exchange, you're going to have this, you're going to have this, you're going to have this, and you're going to have this. And now the problem becomes that this could react with this one. All right, so you're going to get some alkane chain with four carbs, so it's going to be eight, an octane being formed. You can also get this one reacting with this one over there. So you're going to get a molecule with two phenyl rings and two carbons, an ethane in the center and two phenyl rings um, on it. And that's the problem, is that now you're going to get this scrambling effect and you're going to start getting a lot of different reagents. And this is an important consideration. It's a great pity uh, because this would be a fantastic way of making carbon-carbon bonds. But the reality is that metal halogen exchange which is an excellent tool in making organolithiums and, uh, and Grignard reagents as well, uh, in order to use them as nuclear files, uh, at the same time means that this type of chemistry, SN2 chemistry, really just does not work uh, via, um, uh, yeah, uh, for, for these as being as nuclear files. And so what ends up happening is organometallic reagents are almost exclusively then used to add to carbonyl, so aldehydes, ketones, and as we'll see later on, esters <clears throat> as well. So there's one last method that needs some consideration, and that is on how to make organo, um, uh, organometallic reagents, and that's deprotonation. Uh, and there is something called ortholithiation we're not covering in this, in this course, which is related to deprotonation, um, something that we use in our own research. Uh, but all I'm going to speak about here, because it's connected to acids and bases, is something that you really uh, do need to be aware of. Uh, and that is that an alkyne, the H, all right, on an alkyne over there, although it's bonded to a carbon, it has an actually a quite a low pKa. Uh, its pKa is in the region of about 25. Um, and so the the because that pKa is so low, it's actually quite easy to remove that proton. As an example, um, sodium amide, NH2, <clears throat> if we replace the sodium with an H, the pKa of that H would be 35. So the base, notionally with a pKa of 35, it's much more stronger than this proton over there. So if we had to react those two, the Sodium amide, the N minus, NH2 minus, can easily, very easily pick up this proton and we generate this intermediate over here. Uh, so it's a negative charge and there's the sodium uh, plus. So we generate this nucleophile. Now it is a, uh, an organometallic reagent. Um, if we'd used lithium amide, we would have had lithium over there. We could have deprotonated with butyl lithium as well, uh, because this is certainly a whole lot that's got a pK of 50 around. So this one is certainly strong enough to deprotonate over there. Um, we couldn't have used hydroxide, because that's too weak, all right? And hopefully you appreciate that. So the counter iron here is not too important, but it's, what's important is to realize that we can generate these sorts of uh, nucleophiles. And, and the important thing with this is that this nucleophile is absolutely compatible with some kind of SN2 type reaction uh, occurring. I'll just put up something like this as a molecule. Uh, this one is compatible with doing an SN2 reaction, unlike what we looked at before. And the reason for that, the reason this is compatible is that we're not going to get a metal halogen exchange occurring. If this was a lithium, if this was a magnesium bromide, because we did um, a deprotonation with a Grignard reagent, uh, which could also have uh, uh, worked, um, we're not going to get a switching around, and it goes back to those pKa's again. If we change that bromine for an H, the carbon over here, we're looking at a pKa of 50. This one, if we put an H over there, has a pKa of 25. There's a huge difference between the two. And so this reaction over there works absolutely fantastically. So um, if we have an organometallic on an alkyne, it's a really good nucleophile, and it can be used for SN2 reactions. And um, also, as we'll see later, we can also add it to, uh, to carbonyls. So 
Those are the three different methods that we can make organometallic reagents. So we can either do an oxidative insertion, we can either do a metal halogen exchange, or we can deprotonate. And, and, and really the deprotonation is just, we're just looking at alkynes, uh, and that's all we're going to focus on uh, in this course. Um, the big consideration is always acidic protons. We really, really need to make sure, watch out for those acidic protons. Um, they are the, the bane of any um, uh, synthesis. We need to watch out that we don't have them, have them present because it will kill our nucleophiles. They'll no longer be nucleophilic.